Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Suarez. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Houston. And today I'll be talking about um, some work I did on uh, my master's thesis uh, on TSINT, particularly how is the lead and rubidium strontium behaving in the sample. So as we got with that awesome review, we have Martian meteorites. Uh, we have different types depending on their mineralogy groupings based on their um, isotopic signatures. Uh, we're mostly getting shergatites. So our current delivery is, is biased. We don't know where these things are exactly are coming from from Mars. If you were to think about, again, um, if you were to hit a hammer on a hard rock in the field, it would ricochet off. That's essentially what's happening. That's why we're getting all these young igneous rocks. Um, and again, we have about 11 falls associated with um, of these individual samples but looking to the future we'll have you know the perseverance rover that will drill certain particular sites that are designated so that will be pretty awesome to look forward to uh mantle shergatite sources again um I, TSINT is a olivine ferric shergatite. And why we're looking at these isotopes, one, to get an age, you know, when did this thing erupt on the surface of Mars, but also what mantle sources are they tapping into? Um, this is a mixing hyperbola. Uh, what's different about this diagram in comparison to other hyperbolas is this has lutetium hafnium. So lutetium uh, fractionates more essentially. So you're getting a bigger picture. So this looks 3D versus other uh, plots where you're getting other source data that will just be like a two point line. Uh, and this is based on the magma ocean crystallization model that was mentioned. So Mars crystallized, uh, I mean, sorry, Mars, you know, started to crystallize so those early forming cumulates would be our depleted sources. And on this chart, um, they're labeled upper mantle one, two, and shallow upper mantle. And our, um, you know, enriched source would be, you know, that residual liquid that didn't crystallize first. So again, this is another reason why sugar tights are so great. They can one, tell you, you know, the the sort of timing of these magmatic events and also what's going on inside Mars. But like things happen. Uh, sometimes these signatures can get altered by impact processes, as we saw with the last um, presentation, or other alteration processes, fluid rock interactions. You know, we know that liquid water fl uh, flowed on the surface of Mars, so that can also alter um, alter things. But you know. Um, and then also, this is just what's going on on Mars. So a majority of these Martian meteorites, they fall to Earth and they don't get discovered for a while. They also undergo alteration processes on the surface of Earth. So now you have a very convoluted history of these secondary processes. So enter TSINT, which is the closest thing essentially you can get to sample return because it's an observed fall. So what that means is out of all of these Martian meteorites that we have, only five of them were observed to be like someone saw it falling from the sky and collected it very rapidly. So you don't have that chance of having a lot of terrestrial alterations. It's an olivine furic depleted shergatite. So it's depleted in, in its isotopic signatures. It's filled with olivines. And uh, I like to draw attention to um, these um, the cross polarized image, these black spots, these are called melt pockets. These form upon that um, um, impact ejection. So when this impact is happening, things get hot. So it starts to melt a little bit. So those are these little melt pockets. And what's also unique about TSINT is that it is launch paired. Uh, so we can calculate when did a meteorite fly off of the surface of Mars by its cosmic ray exposure age that would tell us how long was it floating around in space and its terrestrial age, which would um, tell us, you know, how long was it sitting on the surface of Mars. TSINT didn't really have that because it was collected like automatically. Um, some of 
this, there are around 15 of these shergatites uh, associated with this ejection. Um, and they're all all levine ferric, so they're all related by their mineralogies and their ejection age. Some of them are dated, some of them are not. The oldest one that is dated, so I listed some and the ones in yellow are dated. Um, NWA 7635 is our oldest 2.4 billion within this pile. Uh, and the youngest is about 347 million. So we take this to mean that this is representing a volcanic center where you have these continuous eruptions piling on top of each other. And uh, there is a similar study with Nacolites that was also proposing a similar uh, process. They took six Nacolites, they dated them through argon-argon, and uh, they had the same ejection age. And once they dated them, you see in uh, figure A, this progression of ages, and they proposed a potential ejection site. And um, again, you know, we assume that these are perfect, like, you know, perfect flows that aren't interacting with anything, but it could be, you know, a series of dikes and sills for all we know. So the big question uh, for my master's thesis is, again, we like to assign these crystallization ages. They're a very important uh, source of information, but with TCENT, there was sort of a of clash of these ages. There was two different ages between three different um, institutions. Uh, at the Johnson Space Center, and it was a difference of about 120 million years. So TCENT fell as a strewn field. That's what these uh, red dots are representing, all the little false spots of TCENT. So it was noted that these separate institutions use separate pieces. So we hypothesized, hmm, maybe this is a heterogeneous field. Maybe this was two lava flows that fell together. So that was, um, sort of my test with that. So I was looking at all three of these isotopic systems. Another uh, question uh, people ask about TCENT um, is, does it have Martian regolith in those melt pockets that I just pointed out? Some uh, who have looked at these melt pockets uh, beforehand note that there are you know, enrichments. So, and you know, when we talk about enrichments, we're usually talking about things at the surface level. Um, and through these, these geochemical data, people have hypothesized maybe there is, you know, regolith within it. So this study was twofold. We took eight pieces of uh, TCENT. They, these uh, were whole rock fractions. Again, I didn't have time to do multi-mineral isochron during a master. So I just was trying to see, did it fall on the isochron or not? And that would give me my tell of, yes, this is, you know, this belongs to the same volcanic um, sort of um, layer. And also we looked at um, a thick section in situ uh, through laser ablation. You can actually see where we ablated it. There's like little holes. And uh, what we're looking at in these uh, melt pockets in particular are the rare earth elements, the lead isotopes, and the highly siderophile elements. Uh, when we're preparing the, for particularly for the rubidium strontium, we created a leachate residue pair. So for those who aren't familiar, when we're, you know, processing these things, you know, these, these meteorites can get contaminated in some sort of way. So you prepare a leachate, uh, you know, uh, in our case, it was hydrochloric acid, um, heated up a little bit because that essentially removes any of those surface contaminants that you might have had on your sample. And you analyze both. So we ran both the leachate and the residue through the chemistry and the mass spectrometry. In this case, we used TIMS. And for the in situ analysis, it was laser ablation ICPMS at UH. Um, University of Houston. Uh, this is the backscattered electron image. And here what we're doing is zooming into these melt pockets. They create these uh, sulfide blebs, as the literature calls it. Um, so that's how you know you can recognize that you're ablating a, um, a melt pocket. And we, again, we looked at all other phases um, besides the sulfides and the melt pocket. 
So with the rubidium strontium, uh, this was the isochron I produced when I uh, put the data of Brennica at all. So this was from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They were the only other people that looked at rubidium strontium. So my data are in red. And as we can see, it falls on that isochron. So that was sort of our tell that this, these samples that I have picked, you know, these are, these are homogeneous, you know, samples. They, they don't differ in dates. And the cooler story, once we plotted the leachates, so this, this um, uh, graph on the right, if we zoom out of this isochron and we plot the leachates, so those, those circles are like essentially that isochron, but flattened out because we've zoomed out. And the leachates from both my study and Brennica are plotting in a very interesting range. They're not terrestrial. They're still Martian, but they're not in equilibrium with the residues. So what we did was we plotted the data from uh, some of those launch paired uh, olivine furic depleted shergatites, and they fall within that range. So these are this whatever this this you know what's in this leachate is showing us a Martian range. And with the lead isotopes, um, we saw a little bit of that. But basically, in this lead diagram, the more right you are, the least radiogenic you are, the more left you are, the more radiogenic you are. So more surface level things. Um, our data are in blue, and we compared it with Meraki et al, who also did a, so our blue um, spots are laser ablation uh, data, and I believe his data was whole rock data, and he also did a residue leachate. So the, his leachates would actually plot right below the zero, zero axis, but they also noted that the leachates they were finding they thought it you know it wasn't terrestrial either so again there's nothing in the lead that's showing us that it has any sort of regolith incorporated in it and um, no other sort of terrestrial contamination either also uh, we looked at you know rare earth elements and highly siderophile elements uh, with the highly siderophile elements, uh, it was consistent of what you would see with mantle sources. So nothing, you know, out of the ordinary to suggest any exogenous components. And our data are everything except the gray, dark blue, and black. And what we're seeing is a depleted signature. Only, um, yeah, so that wouldn't be anything that would be from the surface of Mars. So this question of where was that labile strontium coming from? So terrestrial was very unlikely because it's a fall, it was collected very quickly. Martian, it falls within those ranges of the other launch pair depleted shergatites. And there was nothing within the phases that through laser ablation that was hosting these um, labile strontium. So, what we hypothesize is that perhaps um, the, these residues, what they're, I mean, sorry, these leachates, what they're representing is some sort of coating, some probably um, volatile coating that's related to these uh, launch pair depleted shergatites um, that, happen, that were ejected 1.1 million years ago. So uh, in conclusion, we didn't find any presence of exogenous materials. Uh, there was no enriched components hosted in any of the mineral phases we looked at. Uh, the rubidium strontium analysis um, showed that, you know, that these leachates and residues weren't in equilibrium and that these leachates are within the range of other depleted shergatites. It's nothing terrestrial. And again, our big overarching hypothesis is that perhaps this represents, you know, coatings from volatized uh, materials from nearby um, sugar tights upon that uh, impact ejection process. So that's all I have uh, if, if there's any questions. Great, thank you. That's some really, really cool work. Um, if any, does anyone have any questions, feel free to kind of voice up or put them in the chat. Um, can I just ask about the um, 
the different ages that were acquired from TSINT then, is there, is there any potential suggestion that these uh, sort of labile components could be influencing those isochrons? I'm not sure because I, I wouldn't think that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't really either. I just wondered whether there was any kind of potential link with the variability in age that's being recorded. No, I don't think so. And so following that then, do we do you find or do, have people found similar uh, lead and strontium labile components in material with both ages? Um, I don't know, because they're all testing different sam sub samples. So I don't think it was the same. It's not the same aliquot. Yeah. Fair enough. There's a couple of questions in the chat now, James. Yeah, great. So, uh, first question, just a procedural one about the blank for strontium. Um, can you comment on how much strontium is in these uh, components versus the blank? The blank was good. Um, I don't have that data sheet in front of me at the moment, but the blanks were good. Um, we have a, the sheet that they compared with. Um, yeah, it wasn't too high or anything when we ran the blanks. Yeah. And the second question there from Alex Sheen is, do, we, do you have an idea of what sizes these mineral coatings would be? So any kind of suggestion of what these mineral coatings would look like and what scale they'd be at? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea for sure. Yeah, I, I'll just make a comment. It's Tyson is really interesting for a number of reasons because um, uh, we, we did a study where we looked at the rare earth elements as well, the melt pockets and, and showed that there doesn't seen to be any kind of um, light rare earth element enriched component, which was uh, postulated early in some of the early studies um, as well. It's, I think it's really interesting that you show that basically with the HSEs too. But the the um, but the deuterium content and chlorine and there are indications from other studies that the chlorine isotopes are also heavier in those melt pockets. So there's something that's getting into this rock or has gotten into this rock into those like those locations that became the melt pockets probably through void collapse. So, you know, it indicates that at least that there was some kind of volatiles around that were maybe part of the rock. The question then is how is that related or relatable, right, to the to what you see. But it, you know, maybe there's some, you know, there's some sort of maybe it's related somehow. I mean, we we kind of postulated that it's like very, very low water rock ratio kind of alteration of mineral grains, very low volumetric to, to compared to the rest of the rock, but that you see the signature in these really, in these light elements. So maybe there's a connection there somehow to this strontium signature. I don't, I don't know, but it's a really intriguing. Yeah. Cause it's not anything, you know, within the range of terrestrial, it had to come, you know, from somewhere up there, you know, somewhere on Mars. Yeah, I mean, it's a reminiscent problem to the, the, the kind of unsupported radiogenic lead in shergatites as well, right? So there's a whole bunch of questions about where this is coming from and what kind of process could be leading to it. So, yeah, things to think about. Uh, and just a note, uh, Barbara Cohen put in the chat some work that her postdoc and she did suggested the melt pocket composition could be explained by alteration products. They might uptake strontium. So, yeah, thank you. Right, great. Thanks, Stephanie. I think we'll move on. Um, but yeah, great talk. Thank you very much.